Books to viewers and listeners. I'm really honored today to have a guest who has written a history, a troubling, of the story of a very troubling chapter in America, in the life of Georgetown University, and in uh, the, the lifetime of the Jesuit priest. So I'm going to start with kind of a self-introduction uh, to Rachel Swarms. This is from her book, The 272, and she says, in January 2016, I received an email from a colleague at the New York Times. She told me that she had received a note from a corporate executive she knew who happened to be an alumnus of Georgetown University. He was pitching a story about an 1838 slave sale that had benefited the college. My colleague Louise Story was intrigued. She remembered that I had done archival research for my book, American Tapestry, which had chronicled the lives of Michelle Obama's enslaved ancestors. So she forwarded the email to me to see if I thought it might lead to a story. I took one look at the email and I knew. My work on Michelle Obama's family had allowed me to explore how slavery had shaped American families. This story would allow me to take the next step to explore how slavery had shaped American institutions. Weeks later, I was on a plane to Baton Rouge. So, um, Rachel, welcome to Book Stew. This book. I'm thrilled to be here. This book uh, is a very strong indictment of actions um, taken by the Catholic Church and Jesuit brothers um, to fund uh, Georgetown University. Can you tell us, from starting from uh, the part that I read when you went on the plane to Baton Rouge, did you have any idea what this was going to encompass and uh, what what you were going to focus on? So um, yeah, if you can imagine, this was um, I, I got this email back in January of 2016. Um, and as, as you read from the book, I knew immediately that it was a story. Um, but, you know, I, I was really just getting started. Uh, at the time, uh, a handful of descendants had been identified. Um, and so I knew that I wanted to tell um, a story um, of, of, you know, a child who uh, was, was sold as part of this 1838 um, slave sale um, that benefited Georgetown um, and to take readers on this journey um, with this um, young person torn from you know the world he knew and the people he loved um, take them on that journey from you know the wharf in Alexandria Virginia um, to Louisiana and then across time you know to the descendant um, in, in Louisiana in 2016 learning about this history. Um, but at the time, you know, I think I was very much thinking about um, Georgetown. And, um, you know, I, this book, I, I thought it would take me two years, it took seven. And, and what I learned was that um, it wasn't just Georgetown um, that I was talking about. Um, you know, slavery um, ended up um, you know, financing the emergence of the Catholic Church itself. Um, priests who um, relied on slave sales and slave labor uh, built the nation's first archdiocese, um, the first cathedral, the first Catholic institution of higher learning, Georgetown. Uh, priests who operated a plantation and sold people established the nation's first Catholic seminary. So the very underpinnings of the Catholic Church, um, you know, were established by priests who relied on slavery and slave labor. And um, at, at the beginning, it took it took me a while to see all of that. So was it as you dug deeper and deeper, and you were able to find more and more sources to help you, um, that you, that the vision for what the book was going to be expanded? Because one of the things. 
I thought um, made it such a, a fine uh, read was that you're not only telling the stories of the families who were impacted, who were sold, but you're also telling the stories of the priests who were responsible. There were some priests who um, eventually came around to the belief that this was not the way to fund anything and that slavery was immoral. But in the beginning, they certainly used Bible passages to justify what they were doing, didn't they? That's right. And it's it's always an interesting question. I. I, I... I tell you, you know, I knew immediately it was it was a story, but I was also, you know, simply flabbergasted. You know, Catholic priests enslaved people, Catholic priests bought and sold people. You know, I happened to be black and Catholic myself, and I had no idea. And um, you know, and I really wanted to know more about um, these priests, and I really wanted to know more about these families and. One of the questions, of course, that comes up is kind of how in the world did they justify this? And it's actually interesting and, and complicated because the the priests that I'm writing about, the Catholic priests, you know, unlike some white people, they didn't view the enslaved as animals, as brutes. They viewed them as human beings, as human beings with souls. And they believed that they had an obligation to nurture those souls at the same time that they believed that they could, and they obviously did, buy and sell their bodies. Now, how did they square that circle? As you point out, um, you know, they look to the scripture, St. Paul, you know, the obligations of servants and masters. Um, slavery was legal, of course, um, in the United States and in the colonies um, before um, the Revolutionary War. And, and also Rome, um, Rome condemned the enslavement of the indigenous in the Americas, but took a long, long time to condemn the enslavement of black people in the Americas. Why do you think there was that separation, that viewing of um, enslaving of Native, Native Americans as something that shouldn't be done versus the um, appro basically approving of and use of um, black people who were being ripped out of Africa? It's such a good question. And, and the truth is, I don't have an answer to it. What I can say is, you know, one of the priests um, who was um, a really important person in persuading the church to do this, initially, he made the argument that, you know, um, the indigenous, he described them as, you know, um, folks who were, um, you know, had the capacity for faith, um, and also um, that the the work was was really devastating to them, and and he actually suggested that you know Africans would be better suited to this kind of labor and to this kind of enslavement. Um, he reconsidered um, that um, years later. I think perhaps witnessing what was actually happening um, to those enslaved Africans as well. But there were those kinds of arguments made. I think one of the most amazing parts of the book is the, uh, we're jumping ahead a little bit, but the terms of the sale involved making sure that um, the enslaved people who were sold would have um, access to chapels, churches, um, priests. That was a component listed. So they, didn't see the irony of continuing enslavement um, and making sure that the souls were taken care of. So the bodies no. were like, well, we will use the bodies, but we'll make sure um, that their souls are, 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 that we take care of their souls. That was a very painful part of the book to read. Right, right. And of course, we, we know that, you know, not just the Catholic Church either, right? I mean, um, most um, denominations were involved in, in slavery at the time. And so this was not an uncommon thing. And one of the things that was really important to me, you know, when you're writing about slavery, you're kind of aware that, you know, there are people out there who are immediately going to say, no, 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 long time ago, not interested, <laughs> nothing to do with me. Um, and, you know, if I'm a journalist and I really think about engagement and how to engage people in a story. And so 
the families, I think, was, you know, focusing on the families, that was really important to me. It was also important to me because as a Catholic myself, I knew that, you know, the, the idea that we have of the Catholic Church is quite different from this, right? You know, I grew up in New York, and my understanding of the church was seeing the church as a, a northern church, as an immigrant church, and enslaved people have been largely left out of the origin story that has been traditionally told about the Catholic Church. So I wanted to both to draw people in and to address, you know, the erasure, um, you know, at the heart of the Catholic um, story of the emergence of the Catholic um, institution in this country is to focus on a family. Well, um, can you tell us about the family that you focused on? Because there ended up being two branches of the family who were treated differently. There were uh, people who were, stayed in the Maryland and Virginia area, and then there was, were the people who were sold down south. And I think through your book, I really realized what being sold down south meant. I knew that, you know, up north there was, you know, there was tobacco, there were, um, there were crops like that. But the reason down south was so terrible was because of dealing with cotton and cane. That's right. That's right. And so I, I tell the story of the Mahoney family and their experience parallels the emergence of the, the Catholic Church um, in the British colonies in Maryland and, and the church's um, reliance on um, slavery. And I start with the matriarch a woman by the name of Anne Joyce who arrives in Maryland, a colony established in part as a refuge for Catholics, right? Um, she arrives in the late 1600s as an indentured servant, and she's a black woman um, coming to Maryland as an indentured servant. And we all know a little bit about indentured servants, you know, with a contract and a term of years um, to work and then, you know, go on your way as an as a free independent person. And that was certainly her dream. But she arrives at this moment when Maryland is transitioning from um, an economy that's uh, rooted um, in indentured workers to one that relies on slave labor. She's forced into slavery, her contract is burned, um, she loses everything, everything except her story. And she tells that story to everyone who will listen, the white people around her, for children and grandchildren. And the story is simple. Our liberty was stolen and we should be free people. And her descendants resist. She has descendants who kill an overseer and are executed. She has descendants who take the Jesuits to court, file lawsuits against the Jesuits, trying to win their freedom. Um, but only a few end up um, you know, getting their freedom that way. She has a descendant by the name of Harry Mahoney, who during the War of 1812 saves the church's wealth. And in reward, as a reward for his loyalty and his courage, the Jesuits promise that neither he nor his family will ever be sold. And that promise is broken in that 1838 sale when his family is splintered. One daughter warned by one of those priests that you mentioned um, who was opposed to the sale runs and hides in the woods with her mother. The other sister, who has young children, doesn't make it and is taken on the ship um, and sent to Louisiana and they never see them again. And you're absolutely right about what down south meant. Down south meant, you know, tearing apart families. It also meant a very, very brutal um, uh, slavery regime. Cotton and cane were brutal, brutal crops to work. There were, you know, high death rates, high mortality rates. And, you know, people were keenly aware of that. The, the priests were keenly aware of that. So the, let's talk a little bit about the priests. Um, I mean, I'm, it's hard to, to speak of them with any respect whatsoever. Even the best of them did not really do that much to, to stop the sale or, um, or to stop the selling down south. Um, how, how did, other than biblically, um, do, you, how, do you think, how do you think they justified 
this to themselves. I mean, I guess they felt it was really important to found these Catholic institutions in you know, the young United States where uh, there were not that many Catholics. Um, like if you could get inside their heads, do you think they were ever troubled at all about, um, even when the best of the priests decided to run one plantation as a co-op? He basically um, gave the enslaved people acreage and said, okay, you know, you produce. They were like sharecroppers in a way, which was mm -hmm. not a great life, but it was certainly better than having to worry right. about overseers. Right. I, I think it's, it's, you know, it's interesting. All along the way, there are priests who raise concerns and questions. And you talk about a, a really good example, Joseph Carberry, um, who managed the plantation where Harry Mahoney and his two daughters, who I mentioned, are, are split up by the sale. That, that's where they lived. And he really had a different view of the enslaved than many of his fellow Jesuits. Um, you know, he saw faith when he looked at the people on his plantation and marveled at their devotion. He saw capacity. He wrote a letter about um, a, an enslaved man who built a windmill and marveled at the craftsmanship. You know, the Jesuits were often complaining that people didn't work hard enough. And he, he said, well, maybe maybe we should pay some people. And he established this innovative experiment that you described, giving each family, you know, some acres and, and the freedom to plant and to share in some of the profits. And, and, and the plantation, um, when an Irish senior Jesuit came um, to visit the plantation, he marveled at the change. And, and Carberry also, when he heard word that this sale, this mass sale was coming, he had everyone in his community, white and black, praying that it wouldn't happen. Um, and when it was clear that that wouldn't be enough, he went to Georgetown himself and voiced his protest in person. And when it was clear that that wouldn't be enough, he urged people to run. Now, I would say that he was a lonely voice for sure, right? Um, and the truth is that, um, you know, when Louisa and her mother, you know, emerge from the, the woods and, you know, the ships are gone, Carberry welcomes them back into slavery, <laughs> where Louisa remains um, until the 1860s. And it took me a, a while to wrap my mind around that. How could a guy who was, you know, so vociferous and, and vocal about opposing the sale um, welcome her back into slavery and, and continue to enslave her. And there aren't records um, to document uh, what his thinking was. Um, what I can imagine are a couple of things. One is that he was, um, in effect, a, a kind of middle manager. Um, you know, he was managing this plantation, but, you know, the, the people were, in fact, um, the property of the Jesuit order. He didn't really have the power individually to free people. The other thing is that, you know, he may well have opposed the sale of people, but not the enslavement of people. He may well have mm -hmm. had a very paternalistic view that, you know, he could provide for them, that they needed, you know, um, Spiritual uh, sustenance from him. Yeah, guidance, etc. He may not have had the imagination or or the ability to hear what what in fact they really wanted, um, but we we just don't know. But, but he, the truth is sorry. that he was a lonely voice for sure. Yeah, and um, you know, in the book you talk about the great resistance on behalf of the Jesuits to abolitionists and their oh, yeah. loathing of abolitionists, which, yep, that's right. you know, again is, so how did you find it's, out? It's, it's interesting, I should point out that, um, of course, there's some, certainly some self-interest here, right? The, um, they were benefiting from this slave labor, right? So um, you, can, you can see why abolitionists wouldn't be popular um, at their dinner parties, but the other thing too is that there was um, an anti-Catholic strain in, in in the abolition movement too, and they were keenly aware of that. Ah, okay, good good point. So, how did you did you have the cooperation 
of, um, of Jesuit, uh, Jesuit um, institutions when you did your research? So I got started on this. My first article ran in April of 2016. And Georgetown had actually gotten started and had decided to try to wrestle with this history even before I got started. They had set up a working group um, that started its work in the fall of 2015. And, and so they were trying to understand this history and trying to grapple with it even before you know, I got started on um, reporting on it for the New York Times and, 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 and writing this book. And most of the, um, the documents, um, the Jesuit um, archives, are actually housed at Georgetown. So I had access to those documents. And then, of course, I traveled around the country because there are documents all over the place in courthouses in, in Louisiana, um, in the archdiocese in, in Louisiana, as well as elsewhere. Um, you know, I, I'm a journalist. You know, I, I would say that, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, and people um, don't always give me everything that I would like. Um, I did get um, an email, um, maybe when I was two years in, describing um, some boxes that had been found in the archives at Georgetown. And, and, and the source who reached out to me, an identified person reaching out to me via email, said, you know, we think that they're trying to keep these records from you. I don't know if that was the case. Certainly, Georgetown had not notified me about these um, records. Um, but they did, when I asked to see them, they did allow me to see them. And they were very important records because they were financial um, records um, that showed that um, the money from this 1838 sale continued um, coming in, um, you know, for, for decades, actually. Um, and, and that was really important and, and showing also, you know, kind of where some of this money went. Um, I'm going to ask uh, if, if it's okay for you to do a short reading for us. Um, where you really, this is the prologue, and where you describe um, how, the, how the project really started, if that would be okay. Sure. Jeremy Alexander was sitting in his office when his cell phone rang. It was 2016, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. He was looking forward to heading home for the long weekend with his family but he had been eagerly awaiting this call. The woman on the line was someone who had connected with him on Ancestry, the genealogy website. Jeremy had submitted a DNA sample to Ancestry a few years earlier, hoping to find out more about his family's origins. He'd been born and raised in Chicago, but like most Americans, his family had roots in the South. The caller's name was Melissa Kemp, and she was from Maryland. She had emailed him a few weeks earlier because she believed that they had a common ancestor, an enslaved woman who had been born in Maryland and sold to Louisiana. He was astonished. Could that be true? No way, he told her. My family is all down south. There was never any discussion about a Maryland connection whatsoever. They walked through what they knew about their forebearers, untangling the branches of their family tree. Melissa thought the link might be a woman named Anna Mahoney Jones. Her own direct ancestor was an enslaved woman named Louisa Mahoney Mason. Louisa and Anna were sisters, torn apart by a slave sale in 1838. Melissa asked if he'd heard about the story in the New York Times earlier that year that had described the sale. 272 men, women, and children had been sold by the nation's most prominent Jesuit priests to save Georgetown University, the nation's first Catholic institution of higher learning. Some of those people, she told him, were probably his ancestors. Jeremy was dumbfounded. Did he know about Georgetown? Are you sitting down, he asked her. At that very moment, he told her, he was at his desk in an office at Georgetown University, where he was an executive assistant in the college's Office of Technology Commercialization. And Melissa was telling him that the Catholic priest who had founded the university, his employer, had owned and sold his ancestors. 
I was completely in shock, he said, blown away. The story of the sale that shattered the Mahoney family became national news in April of 2016 when an article that I wrote, 272 slaves were sold to save Georgetown, what does it owe their descendants, appeared on the front page of the New York Times. I had stumbled onto the story a few months earlier when a colleague at the Times forwarded me an email from Richard J. Cellini, the chief executive of a technology company and an alumnus of Georgetown. Richard had become interested in the sale when students at Georgetown had organized a demonstration and then sit in during the fall of 2015. The students were troubled that the names of the sale's main architects had been memorialized on two campus buildings. Georgetown's administration, which had several months earlier established a working group to find ways to acknowledge and make amends for its roots in slavery, had already been considering a name change and agreed to remove the names. Jesuit scholars and historians of slavery were familiar with Catholic slaveholding, but public memory of that history had largely faded in the United States. As Richard followed the news of the protests from his home in Cambridge, Massachusetts, he began to wonder why so little was known about the GU-272, the group of enslaved people memorialized in the hashtag coined by the protesting students. Richard was a well-to-do lawyer and a practicing, a well-to-do white lawyer and a practicing Catholic who had never spent much time considering slavery or racial injustice. But he found himself unable to stop thinking about this enslaved people who had been sold to save his alma mater people whose name had languished in Georgetown's archives for decades. When he reached out to Professor John Glavin, a member of, the, of Georgetown's working group, to get more information about the people who had been sold, he was told that almost all of them had perished in Louisiana, leaving no descendants. Nearly 300 people had been sent south and nearly every one of them had died. University officials say that no one in the university's leadership or in the working group's leadership believed that version of the events. Richard didn't believe it either. It seemed completely implausible. Within two weeks, he had set up an independent nonprofit, the Georgetown Memory Project, hired eight genealogists, and raised more than $10,000 from fellow alumni to finance their research. By the time my story ran, his team, led by the genealogist Judy Riffle, not only had determined that more than 200 people had survived the voyage from Maryland to Louisiana, but had identified a handful of living descendants. This is not a disembodied group of people who are nameless and faceless, Richard said. These are real people with real names and real descendants. Well, um, we can certainly thank him for his effort, um, and that's just from someone who had, you know, no skin in the game, so to speak. Right. He, except that he had a strong sense of of injustice. And do I really want to be known as an alum of a university that that uh, rose to prominence on the backs of enslaved people? How do you think? Um, how have things? Uh, moved along since uh, Georgetown started the working group, since your book came out. Um, I thought I heard, had read somewhere, and I could be wrong, that descendants were going to be um, compensated by receiving admission to the university. Is that, is that off base? So, yeah, so the Georgetown and the Jesuits have taken a number of steps to try to address um, this history and to try to make amends. Um, both um, have apologized um, for you know enslaving people and participating in the American slave trade. Georgetown um, did in fact establish preference and admissions legacy status in effect um, for the descendants of the enslaved. Um, they've also established what they describe as a reconciliation fund. They're raising $400,000 a year to benefit projects that um, uh, support um, descendant communities. The Jesuits, for their part, have partnered um, with a group of descendants to establish a foundation. They've promised to raise um, $100 million. Um, it's the largest effort um, made by the Roman Catholic Church to try to address this history um, in the United States. 
um, but um, it, the fundraising has has been slower than than they had hoped. And descendants have had, you know, mixed um, reactions to all of this. You know, feeling like um, these are important first steps, but but some believe more needs to be done. The other thing that's been really um, all of this, first of all, has, was surprising to me. Um, the other thing um, that has been really something to see and really moving has been um, the work that the descendants have done um, to bring their families back together. Um, you know. 272 families sold in 1838, scores of families torn apart, and now they are stitching those families back together. They're meeting on Zoom, um, you know, they are sharing phone calls and photographs. They've had a number of, of family reunions, and, and that has been really, really something to see. How, as a Catholic and as a writer, so you were a journalist at the New York Times. You had, and you've also written a book about Michelle Obama's um, ancestry. How did uh, this research and the seven years you spent how, did it change you essentially? You know, it's interesting. Um, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm Catholic. Um, I'm a black woman. As I mentioned at the beginning, this was completely new to me. Um, and, you know, I was, um, I often describe this as hard history, right? Because, you know, what I was um, finding um, in the archives um, made for really difficult reading. Um, you know, children sold without their parents. Uh, a girl swapped for a horse. Um, people housed um, in, you know, quarters that were described as, you know, unfit for human habitation, um, the whippings of pregnant women. So, um, you know, this is, this is hard, hard history for sure. On the other hand, you know, I always tell people that this is a story of heartbreak and hardship, yes, but it's also a story of faith and resilience. And one of the things that really struck me was that after the Civil War, when these families had a choice about, you know, where they would worship, so many decided to stay in the Catholic Church, in the church that had betrayed them. And, and not only did they stay, but you know, they worked as, as lay people and, and some as, as, as religious leaders to try to make um, the church more reflective of and more responsive to black Catholics and, and more reflective of um, the universal ideals that, that the church um, espouses. So um, difficult history for sure, but um, you know, I, I was really inspired by those families. Do you see yourself as taking on any more projects like this? Because seven years, granted, what came out of it is, is so wonderful for us all and for you, but um, where do you go from here? So, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor at, um, at New York University, um, at NYU, and, you know, one of the things that I realized as I went along is that, you know, this is not, this is not just about Georgetown, not just about the Catholic Church. So many of our institutions um, have their roots in this history. Um, so one of the things I'm working on now is building a digital archive that will allow um, folks to see um, those connections between slavery and how slavery fueled the growth of our so many of our institutions. I, I've got three buckets that I'm going to focus on first, uh, universities, uh, financial institutions, um, banks, insurance companies, um, et cetera, um, and uh, religious institutions. I'm sorry, so it's universities, financial institutions, and religious institutions. And it'll be a place where, where you can go and, and click on a map and say, wait a minute, in my town, my bank, what? And be able to connect and see the, the document um, that shows this connection. Um, so that's what I'm working on now. This is really foundational for our country. And it's foundational f for all of us to learn about this, um, to acknowledge um, the wrongs and to hopefully um, continue to 
make reparations. So I want to thank you so much for coming on Book Stew, Rachel. This is just, I mean, not only did you write a book that's chock full of historical information, but you humanized and um, made, a, made me really um, just get emotionally involved with the families and you know the brand, two branches of the family, how they were separated, and um, a book, a history book, doesn't always do that. You did a really fine job of of combining personal history and church history, American history. It's really such an accomplishment. So thank you again so much for being on Books Do. Thank you so much for having me. A real pleasure. So, Bookstu viewers and listeners, I can't recommend the 272 enough to you. Um, you can see all my stickies. Uh, please uh, read it, listen to it, um, and uh, you can see I'm like, ugh. Uh, have a good night.